Here we go. Before we put your lives in danger, we tried it last night with a lot more revs. We got it about half the height of the theatre coming somewhere over there. There are large amounts of energy at stake here. Now, we'll try this big one again on a stand. On this stand, there is a spring. On top of the spring, you have a bearing which is free to rotate that way, or a linear bearing to make it go up and down. And we are going to couple this wheel into a pivot. And once again, spin it up with the drill, sorry. Tighten up. Now this looks as if it's going to overbalance for sure. Okay. Right? Ready? If you're careful before the noise starts, as it rises, if I push it round, you should be able to see the spring lift. Okay. 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 Don't go very fast with it. No centrifugal force. I can make it rise. And as I do so, that spring says it weighs less. It looks a monstrous device with all that energy that I told you about to have to catch with one hand. It's no problem at all. It has no angular momentum this way. I can lean down also casually and stop it. It is, as I said, as gentle as a lamb. I didn't give it any energy, so why should I expect to receive any from it? Okay, then. Cool that one down. Are these discoveries new? Well, not entirely. I have had letters from all kinds of people who have done similar experiments before, and for one reason or another have given up for one, lack of know how and scientific background. Two, lack of money and workshop facilities. Three, lack of courage. <laughs> four, lack of anyone to listen. Especially four. Now today I've got all of you here ready to listen. What a pleasure it is to talk to young people who are ready to listen after you've talked to adults. Quite the most amazing letter I had was from a man who wrote quite unemotionally that he performed some of the experiments that I'd done some ten years ago. And he knew that they worked. But he added, I've not told any of my colleagues or friends, because even though I occupy quite a senior post in the scientific civil service, I still have a few years to go to retirement, and I still cherish hopes of further promotion. <laughs> that is a hell of a thing to say in a scientific world, isn't it? This man dare not tell his colleagues. We talk about blackbirds pecking out the white feathers of their colleagues or killing them if they can't because they didn't conform. This man is afraid of being put away because he wouldn't conform. Now this is not the time or place to go into the mathematics of the gyros. This I can do also. It is not the place to attempt an explanation of the phenomenon. But I cannot send you away hungry, you who have come to listen and to learn. I'm going to go back to an electrical experiment in this theatre, someone said, Mr. Faraday, what use is all this? And he was my personal hero. He was the man who showed that Ohm's law was only all right for DC. I'm using this coil again. You put DC through it from a battery, and you get four amps and eight volts. That coil has a property all its own, which we call resistance, Ohm's law. And with 8 volts and 4 amps, you get 2 ohms. 
Now we'll apply some alternating current to the same coil and we'll get our same four amps. Uh, you got the wrong scale on, Benny. And you put the scale right. We're not cheating. You can try this for yourself. This is obviously well known. The voltage is in fact 32. So now we have four amps and 32 volts and we have apparently eight ohms. We call them ohms, but they're not in ohms law. Ohm's law can't have two different values at the same time. The interesting thing is that over 140 years later, we don't say that Ohm's law was wrong. We simply say it is restricted to the use of DC. So, however distasteful it is, we now have to say that object has got something more than a mass. It's got a mass, so long as, and a mass only, so long as we want to push it about in straight lines weigh it, accelerate it, so on. But if we ever choose to spin it, it has another property, all of its own, which corresponds to the inductance of a coil. This is the updating of Newton's laws of motion. But I'm not saying that Newton's laws of motion are wrong. I'm merely pointing out they are restricted to motion in straight lines and to motion where there is no rate of change of acceleration just as there was no rate of change of current for Ohm's law. So, that is at least some food for you to think about and some indication that I have very strong ideas as to how these things work. So, I find no difficulty in saying this thing in a black box had a mass, an angular velocity and no angular momentum because we know that in a reactive circuit you have volts, amps and no watts. What is so difficult at that? And if the abominable no men outside this theatre, this is one of the letters I received, a man called my critics ab abominable no men. They say no before they've even watched. Uh, this eight pound gyro, we're going to spin it up to a speed that'll give about one revolution per second of precession. Have we got the bit of wood, my level? Ah. Okay, I'll try and remember the note. That is about one revolution per second. I'm going to stick a peg in a hole and it did not break off the peg because it had no momentum. Now I can tell you that at that speed the same effect can be obtained if I tilt the gyro to 45 degrees, pin it, put it to 45 degrees and then let it drop. Okay, watch it from the shadow. Didn't, didn't break off the peg, I didn't put it in hard enough. 45 degrees, should have broken, did this morning. I think you can see there's a much bigger blow effected on it than there was when it was rotating. That's the only loser I've had this afternoon, not them bad. That also you could try for yourselves on a smaller gyro. No, I've not invented perpetual motion, of course not. So neither of the scores of people who've written to me saying that they did it before me. Leonardo da Vinci had a picture of a machine like this to dismiss it for all time, that it was impossible. But nobody listened. Leonardo knew all about this. This machine was a perpetual motion machine reinvented throughout centuries. That ball is supposed to roll down that slot, and by increasing its torque and increased radius, it's supposed to bring the next ball in line, and so on, and so on. A perpetual motion machine. Gyroscopes, spinning tops. Perpetual motion. Any connection, do you think? Let's try this one. You can see why they cherish hopes, can't you? It takes a long time to settle down, but it would never work. 
Neither would this one. This is just another reenactment of the same sort of thing. You hope that when that flips over, like that, it'll give enough inertia to bring the next one over and so on. So once given a start, it should just go on. Not a very good invention. <laughs> but in Switzerland, they really believe in flywheels, gyros. They drive buses with them. They drive buses around up hill and down dale for half a day at a time. There is a Swiss bus, and there is a picture of the gyroscope, or the, the flywheel, inside the bus. Look at the size of it compared with the man standing alongside. Enough energy to drive a bus for half a day. And unlike the internal combustion engine, when it goes downhill, it effectively pours petrol back into the tank. You see, in Switzerland, they have lots of ups and downs. And if they're going to have use all the petrol getting up and then have nothing to come back, the flywheel will absorb the energy on the way down. Our little fellow here has done very well, hasn't he? You know, it's a perpetual motion machine. I mean, uh, how long do you think we'd have to wait for that top to stop? Well, I can tell you, you would have to wait five and a half days and nights. You can see there's something rather odd going on, can't you? Inside there, there's a whole box of electronics. There's a little mica chip with six transistors on it. There's an electromagnet in the center. There's a, a metal detecting device. And underneath the top, there's a little bit of steel. And when it gets near the center, the metal detecting device shouts, hey, he's coming, and the electromagnet switches on. And the clever bit is this raised exclamation mark you can see, I think, in the monitor. Because the underside of the top is so shaped that when it's pulled in against that exclamation mark, it runs along it, and it gives it, as it were, a lash from a whip. So it's very like the old-fashioned whip and top idea. And, of course, the top will keep going just as long as there is energy for the electromagnet. And for one very small pocket lamp battery, that will run five and a half days. <laughs> That's a nice story indeed. But if you really want to see... <laughs> ...our gyro really precesses, then we've made one which, in which the rim has been subdivided into a lot of little masses on spring wires, so that when I set it in motion, turn it to the with a camera, you can see this. If I now waggle it side to side, the inner ring that is, you can see the precession taking place not about the point you thought, not about the midpoint here, but about the top and bottom. And if I give the inner ring a spin, you can see this leaning over like a dinner plate. Can you see that? Incidentally, I said that when you had a gyro going, it wanted to maintain its axis of spin. Why isn't that stopping the minute I let go? It wasn't what the other gyros did. There's one for you to think about. I'll answer that next time. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> there is much, much experimenting to be done. I've only tried offset gyros like that. Relatively simple. What about this one? I counterbalance the mass of the gyro here that I've got gyro axis, precession axis, and torque axis. Only the torque and rotor axis meet. And then you can go one stage further and have three axes. Sorry, that wasn't the one. That's that one. That one has all three axes skew lines in space. That, torque axis, axis of rotor, all missing one another. What might that do? And we haven't yet started taking energy out of the rotor, which is what an electrical engineer would call radiation. All this and more must be done. Even the mathematics is not beyond A level. The subject is so new, although it's a hundred years old, the seas are so uncharted, I've only had time to make replicas of those. Edward de Bono encourages us to do lateral thinking, and his books contain delightful examples.